Thanks for tuning into this episode of the Human Performance Outliers podcast with Zach Bitter. All right, everyone, welcome back to another episode of the Human Performance Outliers podcast. I'm your host, Zach Bitter, and today I have a guest interview for you. Today's guest is a return guest, Mike McKnight. Mike's actually been on the show, I believe, three other times. At times, he's come on to talk about some of his nutritional approaches to ultra marathon training and racing. Mike, like myself, follows a lower carbohydrate approach. So uh, I oftentimes like to check in to see what he's doing, if he's making any tweaks or changes to that. Uh, also, he has been incredibly successful at these 200 plus mile races, which is a growing and very exciting aspect to the ultra marathon umbrella of events that have become more and more popular over the last few years. So I've had Mike on to talk about that side of the sport a few times as well. He has a list of accomplishments within this and most recently just maybe topped all of them with his performance this year at the Coca Dona 250 mile race in Arizona, which he has a very interesting history with. And that history continued in what many will maybe consider one of the biggest comebacks in ultra marathon racing history. So just a little reminder of who Mike is and what he's kind of accomplished. In 2017, Mike first started kind of getting interested in these really long ultra marathons of the 200 plus mile nature. And he was able to get first place at the Tahoe 200, uh, sixth place at the Bigfoot 200, and second place at the Moheb 240, which earned him the triple crown, meaning he had the fastest cumulative time between those three 200 mile events. His time that year came to 205 hours, four minutes and 18 seconds. What makes that triple crown of 200s even more interesting is it's all within a nine week period. So it's not like he's got that spread out evenly over the course of the year and he can kind of peak for one, recover, build back up, race and rinse and repeat with three kind of well-timed A races, you are in it once you start with these things. So just doing it is pretty impressive. So Mike coming in with that first year, being able to do that, learning along the way, I'm sure it's pretty impressive. Um, in 2019, Mike kind of got back to the 200 plus mile stuff. He wanted to do that triple crown again and improve upon his performances in 2017. So he kind of started the year off with a win at the Antelope Island 100 mile, but then went on to get first at the Tahoe 200, first at the Bigfoot 200, and first at the Moab 240, winning him the triple crown again, but this time in a cumulative time of 162 hours, zero minutes and 51 seconds. So Mike took over 40 hours off of his first triple crown attempt, and that kind of cemented him as one of the guys in that 200 mile circuit of racing. Uh, Shortly after that, in uh, 2020, I believe, they started a new 200 plus miler called the Cocodona 250. And Mike had a rough go about it. He ended up DNFing. We talk about this in a previous episode, as well as a little bit on this one as we build up his kind of story onto this year's race. Uh, But ultimately, you know, he's kept going with these 200 milers and even longer type efforts with some fastest known time attempts and things like that, including in 2021, he won the Bigfoot 200 and the Moab 240 in 2020 during the pandemic. Mike went out on a solo effort on the Colorado trail, which is about 486 miles. And he did that in the fastest time ever, which came out to be seven days, 13 hours, 16 minutes and 15 seconds for that one. So Mike's got an awesome story. He's got a lot of stories within those Uh, that I like to talk to him about. And we talk about all of it on this episode and including an interesting fueling strategy that Mike used for this race, not necessarily by design, I don't think, although I think he must have had some indication that he was going to do it before he started or he wouldn't have had that resource available to him. But I'll save that one for the show for you to kind of listen to and hear Mike's take on how he fueled himself in the better part of the second half of, of the race. Before we get rolling with Mike, I've got a couple upcoming things to share with you. I did an episode earlier in the year where I was talking a little bit about exogenous ketones. And this has been a topic I've covered a few times in the past. In fact, years ago, I had uh, Brianna Stubbs on, who is a PhD uh, from Oxford University. It was episode 202 for those of you who want to go back and check out. And she has been on the, the forefront of some of the research within exogenous ketones and where they're 
application may be within worlds of health, nutrition, and sports performance. And back then, the, the research was very early, so there was a lot to still be learned. At the time, I think they had some decent research that would suggest that there was a reasonable recovery component to potentially including exogenous ketones into your program. But it was really unclear as to whether they had a lot of application from a purely performance standpoint, meaning like I'm going to use this in a workout or in a race, and it's going to help me get to the finish line faster or help me execute this workout better. Since then, we've had tons of more research come out and actually more recently, a lot more, it's been accelerating quite fast. And it's just been something that I wanted to take a second look at. In fact, this year, at the beginning of the year, I started playing around with exogenous ketones in my own training and racing just to get an idea of like what I noticed, as well as if there was any like negative side effects that would make it less than ideal to use. Because when you think about it, I'm mostly doing hundred mile races these days. So if you're going to introduce a product into something like that, you have to ask yourself, how is this going to impact you on a variety of different things other than just what you maybe even see in a lab. And one thing I was kind of concerned with was what could it potentially be like digestively if I'm going to be introducing an exogenous ketone during a longer race. So I stress test it with a kind of a lower key race for me this year at the Rocky Raccoon 100, where I went in there basically for the main reason of testing this process out. So I could actually stretch out the usage of it for upwards to what ended up being just under 15 hours and just confirm this isn't going to be something where if I do this in a really big goal race down the road, it's going to backfire on me. And I'm going to feel like I wasted the entire effort because of one, uh, one thing that uh, could have been, been avoided. And it was, uh, it went great. It didn't bother me at all digestively. And I'll talk a little bit in this episode, as well as in a future ones where I'm going to dive a little deeper into this topic, what kind of how I used it. But basically what I ended up doing was I started using, uh, a, a bottle of exogenous ketones called ketone performance by Delta G. And the reason why I decided to use theirs was because they actually reached out to me after I'd been talking about this for a little while and essentially told me like I was probably doing it wrong <laughs> and they were probably right. There's just so much information and so many different types and brands of exogenous ketones out there. When you hear the word exogenous ketone, your next question should always be what kind and how is it formulated? Because these are going to be wildly different in what they actually do for you and what the research actually says. So one reason why I wanted to hear what uh, Delta G had to say is Delta G is actually the company that has done basically all the high level research on this. They're in the Oxford lab. They're the ones with the DARPA funding. They're the ones that have been really kind of putting together the formula that you're seeing these research studies put out their results for. So if you want to try to get the results that you're seeing in these research studies, you have to follow the program that they're actually doing in those. And my process was one bottle of ketone performance Delta G before a big workout. I'm not taking it every day or multiple times a day or anything like that. I'm reserving it for big training workouts. So like a, a goal long run, I'll take a bottle before that. And then on race day, I'll take one before the race. And then I'll take one every three hours during is kind of the formula that I built out for Rocky Raccoon. And that's all worked really well. What I've noticed is it doesn't feel like I get like this kick of energy the way I would if I would take in like some nutrition or something like that or caffeine. What I felt it did for me was it kind of gave me a little bit more of a narrowed focus where if I'm running and I'm trying to kind of just keep my mind on a specific task or specific focus and crowd out any of like kind of the background noise seemed to help quite a bit with that in terms of just like kind of alerting me with that, but not to the point where I felt like it was like a big boost of energy the way like like I said, like caffeine would hit or something like that. Interestingly enough, just recently, a research study came out in the Journal of Physiology that looked at ketone esters specifically and uh, reported that it increases circulating dopamine concentration, improves mental alertness, as well as improves post-exercise muscular inflammation in ultra endurance exercise. I'll link to that one in the show notes if you want to dig into that. Uh, but it was just kind of funny to see that, that come out after uh, that was sort of what I more or less experienced myself when I was playing around with it. So I'm actually going to do a few episodes coming up to talk about this, including one with Professor Kieran Clark, who is very much in the weeds with the research and a lot of the product design with this stuff and actually the formulations of what works and what doesn't work is the genius behind the Delta G product line that uh, has been doing a lot of this research and 
producing the results out there. So uh, again, go ahead and check out my episode with Brianna Stubbs. That was episode 202 with the mindset that there's been a ton of research since then. I'll actually probably be having Brianna back on sometime this summer when she's got some availability to chat about what's changed since I talked to her last. And as well as an upcoming episode, I'm going to be doing uh, very soon too, to go over, like I said, just some of the more of the details of like the protocol that I use, as well as what other athletes out there, like the Tour de France athletes and uh, folks like that are doing and maybe how that is different or similar to how I'm, I'm approaching this sort of thing. If you're interested in checking their stuff out, see what kind of experience you get. You can find them at deltagketones.com is their website. And then check them out on Instagram at deltag.ketones. All right, folks, that's all I've got for that little primer of some upcoming episodes and topics around exogenous ketones. A few other things, if you're interested in meeting up, I host a group run on uh, Sunday mornings at uh, Metz Park in Austin. So if you're in Austin or visiting Austin, you want to come hang out for a bit, we meet at 9 a.m. at Metz Park. Details and updates for that from a week-by-week basis can be found on their Instagram page, which is just at OutliersATX. If you are interested in seeing what I have offerings for from a coaching and consultation side of things, head over to my website at ZachBitter.com. I've got a whole bunch of pre-made plans that follow my philosophy and some of the topics I've shared on this podcast, as well as one-on-one coaching if you're into that, and then consultations if you just want to set up a call and chat with me about whatever you have on your mind. Those are all options at ZachBitter.com. And then finally, if you want to check out the catalog of previous episodes, zachbitter.com forward slash HPO is the spot to go for that. Finally, before we get rolling with this episode with Mike McKnight, just a shout out to my primary sponsor for this podcast this year, which is LMNT Electrolytes. They are my go-to electrolytes when I'm training and racing. When it's hot out, I'm going a little heavier on them, but I am often trying to make sure that I'm not just mainlining the fluids without replacing the electrolytes. They have a variety of different options in their catalog including citrus salt, raspberry salt, orange salt, raw, unflavored, mango chili, chocolate salt, lemon habanero, and watermelon salt. And if you're curious because you've tried all those out already, just stay tuned. In a few episodes, I'm going to have an announcement about some exciting updates for their summer flavor line. If you haven't checked them out yet, if you head to drinklmnt.com forward slash HPO, you will be taken to an opportunity to be able to get a free sample pack, a free sample pack of all those flavors I just mentioned with your first purchase. So that'll give you an opportunity to try out all of them and see which ones you like the most. And then if you want to include them into your training and racing regimen, you'll have that option. I had gotten my sweat tests done a while back and found out that I lose 614 milligrams of electrolytes for every liter of fluid. So I'm oftentimes using about a half of one of the packs of LMNT with a, a liter of, uh, of fluid because they are packed with 1,000 milligrams of sodium, 200 milligrams of potassium, and 60 milligrams of magnesium. I'll oftentimes go with the fruity flavors. My go-tos tend to be raspberry and watermelon these days. In my intro workout stuff, if I'm having a little bit before I head out, I'll usually use the chocolate salt into the cup of coffee or tea before I'm heading out onto the roads. So head to drinklmnt.com forward slash HPO to check out their stuff and get that free sample pack. All right, let's check in with Mike McKnight. Mike, welcome back. Thank you, Zach. It's always a pleasure to be on your podcast. Yeah, I always love having you on because you're always doing something crazy. So uh, (laughs) something new to talk about each time. Uh, Yeah, I mean, for folks who are following the ultra marathon running kind of scene, more or less, are probably already aware of why I want to talk to you today. But for those of you listening in who uh, follow the show, but maybe not the sport as much, uh, Mike just recently not only finished, but won the Cocodona 250-mile race. Uh, just how many days ago did you finish, Mike? Um, it was Thursday at 2 a.m., so four or five days or so. Not enough to be recording a podcast is what I hear. <laughs> yeah. If I have some brain fog and I don't say words correctly, I apologize. We'll give you a pass on this one. We'll give you a pass. Yeah. Uh, I mean, one of the, like a race, winning a race is one thing, right? But like a whole nother piece to, I think this discussion that I want to dig into is just your relationship with the Cocodona 250, because 
it's a, a relatively new event. I mean, 200 miles in general are like in terms of like their notoriety in North America are relatively new. There's the Triple Crown, which you've been well known for. Uh, but then Coca Dona's only, this is only the third year, right? That they've done that event. Correct. Mm -hmm. And you've been on the starting line each year. And <laughs> from my recall, it has gotten a little better each time, but it's also each one have come with these just massive, like, sort of like what I would call like race finishing crippling type scenarios where one year it claimed you, but the other two, you had just like some pretty like storybook type performances in the second half or even second two thirds, you could probably say, right? Yeah. Yeah. A little bit more than the second half for sure. <laughs> <laughs> you know, when the second half is 125 miles, it's just, you start to spin the wheels and it gets a little <laughs> mind boggling. Um, yeah. But yeah, I think just like, maybe let's just go through some of that. I mean, that first time you did the Cocodona 250, it was kind of an interesting year because it was inaugural years of any event. There's always going to be things that happen that the RD, no matter how good the RD is and Jamil's a great RD, you're going to look back and be like, yeah, I would have done that differently. Like, Cause you just don't know until you know, and I think one of those things was just like the access to supply and stuff early on in that race was pretty minimal. So you find yourself going pretty far into the event in Phoenix, Arizona, which is known for its heat with, with not a whole lot of great restock on hydration options. And if I remember right, that first year, that was your biggest hurdle. It was like the overheating and the dehydration and stuff like that. Yeah. I mean, Jamil is an amazing RD. Um, and he's also hired another amazing RD, Steve Ad Adderholt. Um, oh, that's right. Mm -hmm. He actually was the, he used to work for Ragnar and he was the founder of Ragnar trail. So he has quite an extensive background with race directing. Um, but I will say they're very lucky that no one died that first year. <laughs> like the, the first 50 K of that course is the hardest 50 K I've ever done. Um, you gain 10,000 feet in the first 50 K. Um, the majority of it is hot and exposed. There's no coverage. And, um, there's a, so there's an aid station at mile 11 and then an aid station at like mile, um, 32 or so. So you're essentially going 20 miles in the heat of the day, no coverage on the steepest climb of the course, like right from the get-go. And you have to carry all of your water for that section. <laughs> um, there was a three liter carrying capacity requirement, which was not near enough. <laughs> um, I ran out of my water a good two and a half to three hours before I got to the next aid station. Um, and I essentially just went into survival mode. Like um, when that happened, I did not have as much of an understanding of electrolytes as I should have. Um, in my head, I was just like, okay, I'm out of water. So the next logical step is to just dry swallow my powder electrolytes. Mm. <laughs> like I had these like single serve packets of Redmond Relight, um, which is similar to LMNT. I know you're sponsored by LMNT, but um, I would just rip the packets open and just dump it in my mouth and like, just try to get like electrolytes. Yeah. Um, but yeah, long, no. <laughs> no, it doesn't work. <laughs> um, but yeah, long story short, like I just dug it such a well, got so dehydrated so off on my electrolytes, I started pissing uh, brown, oh. which is never a good sign. <laughs> um, and I started pissing blood, started showing signs of heat exhaustion, heat stroke, whatever you want to call it. And so I ended up getting pulled at mile 150, went to the hospital and then was diagnosed with rhabdomyolysis and spent a little bit over 24 hours in the hospital getting an IV drip. Yeah. I mean, sometimes, I mean, there's like, there's always the ongoing debate with ultra running where it's like, you know, the death before DNF or just like, when is it proper to, <laughs> I think we've probably moved beyond death before DNF to some degree within like the, at least the, like the, the average ultra runner, but like, there is still this pull of like, for, for a lot of good reasons, like you don't want to drop out of an event. I mean, when you think about most people, a lot of times there's travel, there's all the training, there's just the expenses of all of this stuff. It's like, to show up to that and then not get a finish. Um, there is going to be a level of discomfort you're going to want to push through in order to find that finish line, regardless if it's a good day or a bad day. But, um, you know, you have some of these stories, like what it sounds like you had at that first round at, at Coca Dona, where it's just like, it's, uh, you, 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 you got to consider everything in life outside of just that race too. And, and when you decide to go back out there and, um, obviously that's a disappointing, day for you overall compared to what you had done in the past you'd won the triple crown which for those who are unaware is 
three 200 plus mile races all within a very like is it like it's like all within three months or something like that isn't it it's pretty tight time frame two months <laughs> yeah so like you were kind of the guy when it came to 200 mile stuff so to have to swallow that pill i mean i'm sure like going into that race most people probably looked at you as the favorite being the guy who had that or at least someone that they should be watching for late into the race uh but um having to pull out was that your first dropout in ultra morning too or had you dropped dropped out already at that point um, I dropped out of my first 100K, which was like 2014, but <clears throat> that was my first dropout since then. Okay. Yeah. And that was a different mic back then, I'm sure, than <laughs> the one today. You've yeah. come a long ways, which is an awesome story. For those of you interested too, since Mike has been on here, you know, four other times, uh, just for a quick interest show reminder, those would be episodes 186, 218. And then he joined us on the low carbohydrate performance side of dietitian's dilemma. So if you search for those, you want to get more of Mike's backstory. There's a lot of good info in, in, in those ones. Um, but yeah, so Mike, you being the guy you are, I know you well enough to, when I saw that happen, I was like, well, Mike's going to be back there next year. So you were probably <laughs> the first person to sign up for the next year's Coca Dona 250. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I was up there for sure. <laughs> <laughs> Call it calling Jamil from the hospital. Like, all right, sign me up. I'm ready to go yeah. back up. The, okay. So let's get into that one. Cause I think that one's just like, it, it's kind of like a precursor to this year in terms of how the story goes. So you had a bunch of issues to start that one as well. Like you're probably going into it this time thinking, all right, I know the mistakes I can't make this time. What happened the second time that had you fall pretty far behind early on in that race? So it's funny, all three years, all the issues stem from electrolytes. <laughs> okay. um, so the first year I was dry swallowing my electrolytes because I ran out of water. And the second year, I'm sure you know who uh, Dr. James the niche is. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. So yeah, he wrote the salt fix. Um, I, I started following him before this race and he talked a lot about like preloading with salt before workouts. That's basically the best pre-workout out there, mm -hmm. um, which I do believe, but I also didn't read it enough to like, again, I didn't understand electrolytes as well as, just, as I should have back then, but, <clears throat> um, I upped my electrolytes, but I did not up my, my water. Mm -hmm. So I basically like drank this heavily concentrated drink of um, electrolytes before the race started, got way over. And I just had a ton of stomach issues for like the first day of Cocodona last year. Um, lots of puking, like I couldn't keep anything down. <clears throat> um, it took me about probably 24 hours to um, come back from that. And like, once I came back from that, I want to say it was like, just as the sun was coming up on the second day. Um, you know, Joe McConaughey stream bean, he was leading the race at that point. Jason Coop was there. He was in second place. Um, they were well ahead of me and, um, about whiskey row mile 70 ish or so is when my stomach kind of like regrouped a little bit and I was able to like pick up steam. And then I ended up passing everybody except for Joe. And, um, once like my stomach came around and I was able to start moving better again. Like me and Joe moved at the same pace, essentially for the rest of the race is what I'm told uh, for those of my friends and family who watched the live stream. But <clears throat> you know, at that point he was just so much far ahead. Like I just couldn't catch him. And um, yeah, I ended up getting second last year, but it still wasn't satisfying enough for me just yeah. because of all that mistakes I made <laughs> an improvement, but you knew there was room for more improvement, which uh I guess that we'll, we'll get into that. I, it is interesting with electrolytes though, like, because like, I agree, like there's some preloading you can do, uh, especially when it comes to these ultra running type events, but it gets tricky at the individual level, I think, because there's sort of two things to consider. One is the amount of electrolytes you personally lose in your sweat. So like you get these sweat tests and you can see like, I lose X number of milligrams per liter. Uh, that's kind of step one. Then step two, step two is kind of trying to figure out how much sweating you're actually going to do. So like if, yeah. and this can be, it's not just like weather relative. It can be like from one person to the next as well, where like take, for example, if my wife and I both have got our sweat tests done. So I lose 614 milligrams of electrolytes per liter. She loses like, I think it's like just under a thousand milligrams. So everyone's, you look at those numbers and think, okay, well, Nicole needs more electrolytes than Zach does but I probably sweat three times as much as she does. So for every liter of sweat she loses, I might lose two, three X that, and I'm actually losing more electrolytes per hour than she is. So it becomes this sort of like 
fluid electrolyte balance that you need to kind of be pulling both those levers at the right angle in order to get it right. Or you end up kind of in the situation you did the first time at Coca Dona, where you probably have plenty of electrolytes on board, but you didn't have the hydration, the, the <laughs> fluid side of that equation to really make that work in your favor. Um, yeah. So uh, you figured it out. Like, how much of it do you think is like, because I mean, the, the balance gets more difficult when you add heat into the equation. And the interesting thing about Coca Dona is you start in Phoenix, you end in Flagstaff. So you sort of go from this like hot weather race to a relatively cool or at least reasonable weather race by the end of it. Do you think there's anything to that as well, where you kind of are just, you're just, you're really good and like you're, or better, mo- relatively speaking, in the moderate to cooler temps versus the really hot temperatures? Yeah, that's a good point. <clears throat> One that I've actually never thought of before. Um, I mean, the two times I've finished this race, like it's kind of been the same story. Like the first day was a crap show for me in the heat. And then as it progressively got colder, I started doing quite a bit better. So that's a good point. I think, um, I mean, I went out to, so last year and this year, I went out to Phoenix like for two weeks before the race actually started to heat train. <clears throat> and I do think that that helped me quite a bit. Um, I mean, this year, like when I left to go there, like there was snow in my front yard, it was like 35 degrees. And then like, I get to Phoenix and it's in the mid nineties. Like Mm -hmm. that's like a 60 degree temperature swing for me. So I do think that there, that, that is a, a, an aspect of Coca Dona that makes it so hard because it's early. A lot of people are coming from colder places. Um, but yeah, I do think that that is a factor that plays into like why I'm able to turn things around a little bit later into that race because of the cooler temperatures. Mm-hmm. It's just it's such an interesting, I mean, you get these long races in general. There's so many variables that go into it. It's hard to know which one, or I mean, there's probably really one variable, but like which ones are going to be the, the bigger ones to focus on. And then you add one like that, where you have like this almost a total geographical change uh, yeah. due to the nature of that event. So, all right, second place, not quite satisfied. You're used to winning these 200 miler things. So you're coming back again. (laughs) So this year, tell us about the start of this year's race. Again, electrolytes. (laughs) Um, But I I had like the right uh, ratio and everything dialed, but a a different mistake was made this time. Um, So the race starts at 5 a.m. We left our Airbnb. Everything was going smoothly. Um, we were getting close to there and I realized that I forgot my bladder. I left oh, it in no. the fridge. Yeah. Um, and they have, they had a four liter carrying requirement this year for that first hot 50 K. And so that was like two of my liters right there. So we flipped around, flew back to the Airbnb, put it in the car, p- punched in the uh, address of the start line. And it told me I was going to get there like four minutes before the race even started. <laughs> And so like already like things started super hectic for me and kind of disoriented. Um, but anyway, we got there, I rushed over, I grabbed my tracker. I got into the starting corral with like just over a minute before the race started. <clears throat> um, I was loading my GPS watch up and like, for some reason, like, I don't know if it updated or something, but like it glitched and everything turned into Japanese. <laughs> oh no. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> You're not so, bilingual, like, I suppose either. Are you? <laughs> no. <laughs> No. So like I started freaking out there. Like I pulled my phone out, like I tried fixing it. And like, all of a sudden, like the race started and I had to put my phone in my pocket and start the watch and just kind of go with the flow. So I had no time to think. And amidst all that, like I got two and a half or three miles in, I reached in my vest to pull out a salt pill to take. And I realized that I forgot to grab my salt pills. Oh, no. So I went that whole section, like it's good. <laughs> Every year it's been different. The first year I had not enough water, but I had plenty of electrolytes. The next year I had too much of the electrolytes, not enough water. Then this year I just had way too much water at the start and not enough electrolytes. Like I had no electrolytes essentially mm-hmm. for that first 50 K. Um, I got into the aid station before the big climb and thankfully they had some salt pills, but like it was one of those pills, like the pills that I use have 300 milligrams per pill. Mm -hmm. Uh, the pills that they gave me had just a little bit over a hundred milligrams. And so they essentially gave me 600 milligrams of salt that I had to kind of ration through that whole section. And so again, like I just started having stomach issues that entire first day because I got so behind on my electrolytes. Um, I was trying like, once I got my electrolytes, I was trying to find this happy balance of like trying to catch up and not overdoing it because 
you know, obviously if you like take 2000 milligrams of sodium at once, you're going to have some stomach pain. Mm -hmm. Um, but at the same time, I was like having cramping issues because I didn't have any electrolytes in me. So just that first day, just, there was so much hectic, hecticness. Is that a word or is that my brain fog settling in? <laughs> <laughs> I think we get you. <laughs> okay. Things were just so hectic that first day, like, um, and it, it kind of sent me into a bad mental space and I ended up getting very, very, very far behind on that first day. Um, so you're sitting in like. 70 something i think like the the tracker suggested 60 second place which isn't always entirely accurate i think i found out after the fact it was closer to like 73rd place or something like that yeah so the tracker said 60s my pacer who is a, a phoenix native he told me that he woke up tuesday morning um because he was getting ready to come catch me because i told him that i would be like Mingus mountain or something at that point. Like essentially I told him I'd be 30 to 40 miles ahead of where I was in that moment. And he told me when he checked the tracker, it said I was in 73rd place. So all I know is that is a like, you know, mid sixties to mid seventies, somewhere in there. Um, mm -hmm. I was also told that the aid station that I came into, um, the first place, Michael Versteeg and Killian Korth, they left just over nine hours ahead of me. And I checked the tracker when I got there and they were just over a 50 K ahead of me at that point. So I definitely lost a lot of ground in that first day. <laughs> yeah. I remember looking at one point and seeing that you were like 50, something in that neighborhood behind and just thinking like that it probably just wasn't your day. Uh, I know you're a strong runner, but I mean, 50 K is a, a big gap. In fact, like people are probably, if they weren't, I'm not going to be a spoiler at this point, but like with the, the ultimate outcome here, but it's just like, there's a discussion, I think on Twitter for a while, like after it was clear that you were going to take the lead, I don't think anyone assumed you were going to relinquish it at that point, once you close <laughs> that gap. And so it's like, what's the biggest comeback in ultra running history? And it's like, and then it goes to another side conversation of like, well, how do you balance out from the distance to distance? Because obviously if you're in like if you're in a hundred K, there's never going to be a 50 K gap to close to begin with. So how do you like, <laughs> how do you adjust distance or time adjust for like a comeback? So there's like this uh, conversation about some of the most epic comebacks. And and it was like hard to really think of one that was really like, at least sounds more impressive than, <laughs> than what you did. <laughs> so, yeah. And, and then I, then I think I can't remember, I checked at another point and you were essentially like one aid station behind, I think it was maybe a nine mile stretch. If I, I could be completely off on that just for everything that sticks out in my head. And I was like, okay, well you were clearly moving up, but in my mind, I was thinking it was probably going to be more similar to like last year where you have this massive comeback, but the odds of taking the lead are, are low, but eventually it got to a point where the reporting like I wasn't following it super close in the beginning but by the end after kind of hearing everything momentum building I started paying attention much closer and then someone had been following the whole time is like Mike's going to take the lead in this next going into this next aid station he'll be the first runner through was what they were predicting based on how you had been progressing at that point so what was it like as you got with it or I should actually say like it, was there a point during that where you were just like okay I'm not going to win this thing, but I'm going to get it done before you had to eventually switch back to now I could actually win this thing. To be honest, there was never that point. <laughs> like it was either I'm quitting this thing. My day sucks. Like I can't finish this because of how crappy things are going to I'm going after first place. Like, so essentially I came into um, the friendly pines aid station which is the aid station before whiskey row. So it was around mile 70. Mm -hmm. um, I came in there and like the whole two sections before that, I called my wife and crew probably 20 times, just like complaining. <laughs> <laughs> like I was so miserable out there and like they could hear on the, like I came into that aid station and they were like expecting me to quit. Um, and it was like probably 4 a.m. or so. And so I came in and we were all just like, you know, if you're going to quit, you're going to quit, but like, just hop up in the tent, take a nap, wake up for whenever you're going to wake up. And then we'll talk about it when you wake up. Mm -hmm. And so that's what I did. I climbed into my tent. I took like a two to three hour nap at friendly pines. 
um, going into that sleep, like I was like, okay, whatever, I'm going to quit when I wake up. So we might as well go find a hotel right now, guys, <laughs> kind of a thing. <laughs> but so I went in there, I took a nap. And then when I woke up from that nap, like, like I was thinking a lot more clearly, I felt a lot better. I was able to stomach some food down. And so like I climbed out of the tent and, um, I told my crew, I was like, okay, I'm just going to do this next section, see how I feel. It's only eight miles, mostly downhill. So I went out and did that section, which took me to whiskey row. Um, and if you look at my stories, I was going through my stories. My wife was like posting, um, for people that were following me, I was not the one doing all the posting. That was mm. my wife. <laughs> but like when I'm leaving the aid station with, um, where I took that nap, um, my wife posted a story that was just kind of explain. Oh, another issue that I was having is I was having, um, pain on my spine. Um, for those who don't know. Oh, you back just issues, okay. they, they were saying on the recording, I think. Yeah. So I broke my back just over 10 years ago and I have hardware in my spine. Um, most of my races, I end up getting some form of lower back pain, but this race I was having pain like directly on my spine, which I've never had before. And, you know, as I feel my spine right now, like I have a super bony spine, but like in the moment, like when I felt it, like I made up this arbitrary, um, like ridiculous story in my head that my screws were coming out of my spine. <laughs> <laughs> like, I think I was looking for reasons to get pulled kind of a thing. Yeah. <laughs> um, so anyway, so like when I left friendly pines, my wife did a post saying Mike's going to try to do this next section. He's not out of the woods yet. His back's hurting a lot. We'll see what happens. And then when I got to whiskey row, like I sat down, <clears throat> my crew, like could tell that I had a little bit of fire inside me and that I was ready to keep going. And all of my crew said, like, if you pick up the pace, we think you can get top 10. And I like, I was taking, I was changing my shoes and like, I was changing my shoes. And like, I looked up at them and I said, no, I'm, I'm, I'm going for first and for the course record still. And like all my crew just like made these like faces at me, like, like, okay, buddy, like, you know, if that's going to motivate you to get out of here, cool. But like, <laughs> just, we hope you're being realistic with yourself kind of a thing, but like, from whiskey row to the finish, like I just, I had no doubt that I wasn't going to get it. Um, I don't know why, but I just felt motivated and determined and I was going to make it happen. <laughs> yeah. You know, the interesting thing about ultra running is the way I try to describe it to some of my coaching clients sometimes is like, it's a series of knowing when to zoom out and when to zoom in. So like a time to zoom out would be if you're making a monster out of this big event, when in reality, the event itself is a small, small part of the entire picture of when you started preparing to the day you cross that finish line. And then there's a time to zoom in as well, when it's like you have yourself in a situation where asking too many questions just creates anxiety, creates doubt, negativity. And it's like, I think for you, it's like, for whatever reason, it, for whatever reason, you zoomed in and decided I can still win this thing and didn't really consider like, oh, I'm 50 kilometers behind or I'm X number of hours behind or I'm in 73rd place or whatever it happened to be at its worst. You were just like, OK, I feel good. So it's time to move. And, you know, that got you there. And I think it's it's such a great lesson, too, because it's like let's say like, like just you don't even know what's going to happen up in front of you either, because like it's like you could have a situation where you know, even if you didn't make that massive surge, a couple of guys drop out in front of you because something happens to them. And then all of a sudden you're moving up by, by, by carnage versus by, you know, just actually physically passing somebody. So it's like, I think there is maybe a little more incentive if you're honest with yourself to stay out there in a lot of cases, because you just don't know what the next person's thinking or what kind of shape they're in either. Yeah. And I've done these enough to know that like <clears throat> night two, day three, kind of a thing, like that's when the wheels really start to fall off for people. Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, um, you know, last year, like Coop, for example, he was in second place for the majority of the race. And, you know, I caught him on night two with like maybe 80 or so miles left to go. And like, you know, the wheels kind of fell off from him just from a sleep deprivation standpoint. And I'm pretty sure I ended up finishing like a good eight to 10 hours before him. Um, so like, I've just, I've done this enough to know that like sleep deprivation is one of those things that I, like, I don't like talking about myself or like talking about what my strengths are. Like it feels weird for me, <laughs> but like one thing that I'm like a hundred percent certain in saying is like, I do really, really good with minimal sleep. 
And so I just know that once everybody's will start falling off from lack of sleep, that's just kind of where my consistency and drive starts to kick in. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You've mentioned a couple of things that kind of steering me towards a question I wanted to ask you, which is about that component of these. Cause I think it's like, it's one of those things where it's long enough where I do think optimal performance comes with some sleep. You know, it's not like the 24 hour where in most, at least at the top end, you're not sleeping during a 24 hour and maximizing your performance. Um, The 48 hour, I think you can maybe start considering that, but like you're definitely in the range of, I think sleeping is probably when you're talking about third night type of situations. So then the question always becomes like, well, when and how do you do it? Uh, So I would love to hear your protocol for sleeping. Is it something where you try to structure it or do you just say, Hey, I know I'm going to probably need to sleep X number of hours, but I am going to wait until my body absolutely says the time is now I'm doing it, whether it's on the side of a trail or if it's in an aid station with a cot and a blanket. So I think sleep that or sleep in 200 mile races is one of those, like, there is no correct answer right now. <laughs> like Um, I watched some of the live feed, um, after the race and like they interviewed AJW during Mm -hmm. it. And he was talking in one segment just about like, you know, hundred milers, we've essentially figured out the recipe for success, but 200 milers, like, you know, we don't really know if there is a recipe for success. And I definitely feel that way about sleeping. Mm -hmm. Um, because I mean, mostly it's just so individualized. Um, so for me, like I found the best protocol is just you know, skipping the first night. I didn't do that this time, which makes me wonder if like, I'll do better if I do sleep the first night, since I had such a big comeback after sleeping that first night, but typically I'll skip the first night. And then once the sun comes up the second day, I'm usually good because the sun's up. And then it's that second night when I need some form of sleep. And for me, the way I do it is just like, I just keep going until like I start falling asleep while I'm running. And then I'll just like lay down and take like a quick dirt nap. And sometimes, and when I say quick dirt nap, that's anywhere from five to 20 minutes. And in a lot of cases that five to 20 minutes, five to 20 minutes gets me to the finish and that's all I need. But sometimes like I'll take that five to 20 minutes, get to the next aid station. And I can tell like, like, okay, that, that five to 20 minutes was not enough. So I need to take about 30 minutes to an hour at this aid station. And Mm -hmm. so, I mean, to like <clears throat> the story that I just shared about how I took like a two to three hour nap at the earlier aid station, uh, this year at Cocodona, like that's the most I've ever slept in an aid station before. Like I've never, ever slept more than an hour in one given moment in, in one of these races. So you're thinking you know, that's strategy just, over. <laughs> I know I, I have a lot of thinking to do. <laughs> so but like, the, Oh, go ahead. Keep going. Well, and I was just going to say like, you got to factor in the people who are at the back of the pack, like they're out there for five days. And so obviously they're going to have to like do some form of structured sleeping, whether it's two to three hours a night going into that third, fourth and fifth night. Like, you know, that's, that's when you really got to start prioritizing sleep because if you don't, you like, there's a lot of, a lot of um, stuff that can happen to you if you don't. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, the interesting thing is there is some research on this. It just happens to be in a different sport. So they, I I mean, cycling seems to always get funding first for like, I think, well, maybe obvious reasons. I don't know. There's a, um, there's a study that looked at this though for, I can't remember the exact event, but it's a multi, it's an event similar to this where it's multiple nights that you're going to go through without sleep. And you think like, it's probably driven by safety more with cycling. I would imagine. Cause like the, the repercussions of falling asleep on your bike oh. way higher. Right. Like, um, and they, what they looked at was they measured, they, they, they looked at a couple different teams that took different strategies. And one was like a sleep earlier in like, so versus trying to get so far that you're like on fumes and then start sleeping versus like, all right, I'm tired enough to sleep, but technically I could probably push through a little bit more. And I think the team that slept earlier performed better, at least better at the end of the event than the teams that didn't. And a lot of it was cognitive related stuff, I think, where it was like, you know, you just like your ability to respond to to different things coming at you, which maybe would be, I guess the thing to tease out for something like you're doing is like how much more important or less important is it for what you're doing running and hiking versus being actually on a piece of equipment where obviously a one mistake have it carries a lot more consequence than like you maybe stumbling a little bit. Um, 
but I do think there's like some stuff to be pulled from that where it's like, obviously if like you decide to structure it and you lay down and don't sleep, like that's kind of a loss to some degree. So that part of me leans towards sleep when you feel like you actually can sleep. So you're very efficient with your sleep time, but don't necessarily avoid it or try to push through it if it presents itself early. Yeah. Never push through it. Like if it's presenting itself, you should take advantage of that. In my opinion, Mm -hmm. um, I do think it's more intuitive, like look at the actual course and like, I mean, this will be really hard if you've never done the course before, but like actually studying the course and like figuring out where you're going to be throughout the course. Like if you're maintaining a certain pace, because one thing I noticed is there's two sections in Cocodona. Um, last year and the year before I've done these sections at night and they're extremely hard to navigate. One of it you're going, it's called the granite Dells. It's in Prescott. Um, and it's kind of like this, like Zion, Utah, Moab, Utah, like slick rock type area where there's not a lot of foliage on it. And they just like mark the trail with like these spray painted white dots. Mm -hmm. And so like, it's really hard to navigate. Like I remember like last year and the year before, like stopping, looking at my watch, like trying to see where the arrow was pointing me and following it just because I couldn't see any of the markings. Um, and then there's this other section that's called, um, iron King to Fane ranch where you're essentially just running through a cow field. There's mm-hmm. no trail. <laughs> and mm-hmm. like the markings, on uh, the flag markings don't line up with the course that's on your watch. Uh, at least the two times I, or the three times I've done it now, like the, the markings never line up with the course on my watch. And so like when I do it at night, like I'll, I'm trying to follow the trail on my watch, but I'm also using my headlamp trying to find the flags. And I end up just kind of zigzagging through this field because mm-hmm. I can't see where I'm supposed to go. But this year I did these two sections in the daylight and like I blew through those sections because I could see the white dots clearly. And when I got to that cow field, like even though the route didn't match up with the flags, I was able just to see where all the flags were. And I was just essentially able to beeline it to where I needed to go. So, I mean, if I was to do Coca Dona again next year, like I almost wonder if I would purposely try to sleep that first night just so I can do those sections in the day. And not to mention too, like on day two, there's a section that I've always done in the heat of the day that's super hot and exposed and just really depletes my energy because of how hot it is. And I ended up doing that section at night this year and I was able to fly right through that too. So, Mm -hmm. I mean, that makes me wonder like, you know, if I was to do it again, if I slept early on and like had that advantage later on in the race, like, you know, I think that I just made up so much time in those sections strictly because of like switching the time of day that I was doing it. Yeah, it's interesting too. And I mean, it'd be one thing if you won and finished like hours and hours behind the precedent, but, you know, granted it's a three-year event, but uh, I mean, McConaughey's obviously an established, very successful long haul. Uh, I mean, his, his accomplishments are very, very strong in that department. So it's like, it's worth probably like considering that his time probably isn't like super soft or anything like that. And, um, you broke the course record. So like, there's a, there's gotta be some, some indication in there that like, even with like, obviously you would like to go without the stomach issues, the back issues and all that stuff. But the general timeline that it laid out may be a better path forward. And then if you can have it with a good stomach and no back issues, now how much better is your perspective and just everything else that kind of goes with it throughout the course of the event to even let you throttle down a little bit more at the end of an event like this. And I do want to point out too, that there are technically two course records um, because the course last year that we did that, that Joe won was a, a much easier race um, oh, they had, that's right. They had, mm-hmm. they had a fire and so they had to reroute the section. And so that first 50 K was not a part of the course last year. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. So like my time last year actually was faster than my time this year. Um, so there are two course records. Joe set the course record for the, the fire reroute course, whatever you want to call it. <clears throat> and then, um, I broke the course record on the original course, which is slower than mm-hmm. Joe's time. And the one they'll stick to when they can, I suppose. So yeah, interesting. Hey folks, just a quick reminder that this episode sponsors include Element T electrolytes and Delta G ketone esters. Element T electrolytes can be found at drinklmnt.com forward slash HPO and are offering a free sample pack with your first purchase. 
and Delta G Ketones can be found at deltagketones.com. Also, give them a follow at deltag.ketones on Instagram. The, the other thing I wanted to ask you about sleeping in this stuff, just generally speaking, is kind of the monitoring of it. I had uh, John Kelly on after he won Barclays this year. And he had this funny story where, I mean, similar event in the sense that you're out there for, for Barclay, like just under 60 hours. So you're looking at like a, a fairly similar timeline. And so, you know, you get the same type of questions, like when to sleep, how to sleep, the low tech nature of that race, where they can't have watches other than those little like $10 Casios, wherever they hand out, just so you can see the time of day, essentially, apparently they're supposed to have an alarm on them though. And he got uh, he get, he he got to a spot where he wanted to sleep, and he realized his watch was broken. The alarm part of it was broken, so he couldn't set an oh. alarm. So what he ended up doing is, you know how you have to find those books, and that's how you show you got to each checkpoint. You take your page out of the book, and then you bring. Yeah. I think it's like nine of them down to the to the start finish area to confirm that you did the actual course. And he, what he did is he slept on the book. So worst case scenario is the person behind him would have to wake him up to get their page. So he couldn't sleep too long. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah. And That's I, a gamble I, in that race because who knows if somebody even finds the book. <laughs> right. It's, it's crazy. The number of gambles they end up taking because out of just necessity and probably just like hard to really consider anything else that go like when you hear the, the number of them, it just seems like, how does anyone ever finish this thing? But you know, here we are, I guess. So uh, but anyway, I was going to ask you, like, when you take a nap, are you like setting an alarm or how are you setting, how are you structuring that in a way where you sleep enough to get the rest, but not like, you know, finding out, oh, I just slept for eight hours. Now I'm kind of way out <laughs> <of> nowhere. <laughs> no, I'll usually either set an alarm or have my pacer wake me up. Um, or, you know, obviously if you do it in an aid station, your crew will wake mm -hmm. you up. <clears throat> but the rare moments that I've taken a nap without a pacer, I've set, I just set like a 10 minute alarm on my phone. Okay. And I, oh, I'm sense. a very... And I'm a very light sleeper, so I've never had any worry that I'll sleep through an alarm. Like I've never slept through an alarm my entire life. <laughs> yeah, I would think just like in a situation like that, like any slight disturbance is probably going to pop you up because you're like, you know, you're you're yeah. just I mean, you're <laughs> out there for a reason, and it's of an important reason in your mind. So I would think I, it would be pretty easy. Yeah, and I will say too that like <clears throat> it is important, like. This is something that a lot of people might not even think about, but I've heard of people that wake up from their naps and they're so disoriented that they like start heading the wrong direction. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so there are people like it is a good practice. Like, um, you know, me personally, if I ever sleep by myself on a trail, I'll like lay my pole down with like the, the bottom of the pole direct pointing in the direction that I need to go kind of a thing. Uh, so it is important, like if you're taking these trail naps to like, make like realize that you're going to wake up disoriented and then have a plan set forth to like, be able to help yourself rolling in the right direction. Yeah. It's funny. Cause it's like so many things that go into this almost like merits some experience in order to know even to do that ver or at least talking to other people who do. So it's like, it's almost like rewinding the hundred mile distance back to the point before, I mean, we, there's still a lot, I think we don't know about the hundred mile distance, but we've done a much more thorough job of stress testing that one to the degree where I think like there is a lot of like areas we can point to with like a little more certainty. Whereas with these 200 milers, like there's still a lot of just like, Oh, well, so-and-so said that this worked well. I think I'm going to try that. And there's like really, really no real reason whether it will happen to you or not, but that's kind of how it gets done. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. I mean, there's no one just like AJW was saying, it's just such a, I mean, it's been around for a lot longer now, obviously, but it's still so new. And I mean, I don't think, I personally think that we'll never reach a point where we're, we can confidently say like, this is the recipe to success for a 200. Like, I do think that there are basic things to do to help you be more successful, but <clears throat> when it comes down to it, like sleep and nutrition, like there's just so many things that I believe with 200s that are kind of individualized to your personal my body. Mm -hmm. I think with things like this, what ends up usually happening is you get like some kind of pillars of things, you know, you need to do. But then after that, it gets very expansive as to how you do them. I think like nutrition is a great point for this, where it's like, you know, you probably should be eating and drinking during these things. So everyone, that's the universal truth. 
then <laughs> beyond that, although I'm talking to the guy who did 100 miles with eating nothing once, so <laughs> <laughs> yeah, of course I pick you to bring up this this example. <laughs> the the but like what you actually eat and like you know what actually works for you versus the next person within the concept of making sure you're eating and drinking throughout it could be quite varied and there may be a lot of successful paths forward there you know versus what maybe we see in other sports that are a little more fine tuned or just to a degree of intensity and duration where like it's just like a little more simple to whittle down what's not going to work at a higher degree than what you can for something as low intensity as 200 mile races yeah and I mean, just playing off of that, like an analogy, you could say like, you know, building a house, like here's the foundation. The foundation is you need to sleep, you mm-hmm. need to eat, you need to train, you need to pace yourself. Like, I think that's a huge one that that people overlook. Like, you know, we've all been in there in a race where like, you know, you plan on pacing yourself, but as soon as the gun goes off, like you get sighted and you're worrying about what place you're in and you sometimes push too hard. Like, I think that that's one of those things that really can screw up a race in a 200, a race of that magnitude. But, you know, you have this foundation, like these are the things that you need to do, but then like, you know, you got for like contractors and home builders out there, like you got your frames Mm -hmm. and like those frames for building that house, those are the individualized things. Like, yes, I need to sleep, but for me, like how much sleep and when should I sleep and what nutrition and how much nutrition and so on. So I do think there's a basic common practices that everybody needs to implement to get ready for a 200, but then just a lot of experimentation to really fine tune, like how it's going to work for your personal body. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I agree. Uh, Speaking of that, like another thing that popped up while you were out there that I had to send you a text to confirm, because I was (laughs) the the only reason I even gave a second thought was because it was you. If it had been anyone else, I would have just assumed it probably wasn't accurate. (laughs) But when your stomach went and you started rallying, someone said, Mike is making a comeback and he's, his stomach went and he's consuming nothing but raw milk. (laughs) And it's like, like milk, milk's a a perfectly fine food in my opinion, like generally speaking. But I think like you asked the average endurance athlete where where milk fits within the, the typical strategy of things that are they're going to not only like look at you weird. If you say intra workout, they're going to be like repulsed by the idea of even (laughs) considering to do it. So like, what is the story behind that? Is it accurate (laughs) in any capacity? (laughs) Um, It's not accurate in the sense that that was the only thing that I was having, (laughs) but I would say like, if I was to throw out some arbitrary percentage, like 90% of my calories came from raw milk during this race. (laughs) And like, I don't know why, but like I can drink milk like water. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like when I finish a big training run here in Utah, like I'll come back and I'll down half a gallon to three quarters of a gallon of raw milk, like just like that. Mm-hmm. And like, I don't feel bloated. I don't feel sick. I don't have to run to the bathroom to puke or crap or anything like that. <laughs> <laughs> like for some reason I can drink milk like water. And even like before Cocodona started, <clears throat> I think I either had some kind of food poisoning or just like the heat just messed up my stomach or maybe a combination of both. But about a week and a half before Cocodona, there was a day where I was just violently puking throughout the day. Mm. Um, I couldn't eat any solid foods, but I was still able to drink raw milk. (laughs) And so like, no matter like how sour my stomach is, like I can drink milk just like it's water. And so, Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah, like, you know, a lot of my calories came from raw milk just because of my stomach. Yeah. I mean, just as interesting as the absurdity of that is the, not that you drink raw milk, but that you were fueling with it during your race <laughs> is, is like, I, I tell, I talk to this about my coaching clients a lot when we're talking about their race day fueling strategy, because I think like, obviously there's all the sports products, which people kind of intuitively think, okay, well, that probably has a place in this, in terms of being like a, uh, a resource available to you that is kind of designed for this specific type of thing. And then there's like, I think good reason to believe that some solid food uh, or something that kind of deviates a little bit from that is a good balance to kind of throw in there. And I would imagine even more so when you get to these longer events, like 200 plus milers, where not only can you tolerate it, but it's probably going to like in the shorter versions of the ultra marathon world, you're going to probably have a little better digestion when you're not just mainlining sports products all day long. Um, even if it's just palate fatigue. So where we, where I usually start with that is where I look at like, well, is there anything in your daily life that you eat like almost daily 
uh, that we could use as a practical you know, fuel source during the race itself, because that might be a good starting point, at least. So when we're building out your long run, we'll lean on the sports products that you've used in the past and no work, but we'll balance that out with something hopefully contrasting in flavor consistency. So if it's like a sweet liquidy gel substance you're using for a sports product, maybe something salty, crunchy, a little more savory with a solid food option. And if they already have something that they're using on a frequent basis, we start there because it just makes sense that their body is kind of like digestively able to tolerate that. So I wonder like maybe it's not so far fetched that that works for you because it's something that is in your daily life at a, like how much raw milk do you think you drink in a week? Um, I know we buy seven gallons a week, (laughs) but that's for my whole family. I would say I go through five of those gallons a week personally. Okay. Yeah. I was going to say, I'm sure you're probably the mass consumer of everything for the most part in the family, but um, yeah. So I wonder like, you know, just, just the fact that like it, you know, I think there's just, there's a lot of things I think, I guess if I'm going to like, say, here's the lesson with this is if you pay attention to what you described, where it's like, Hey, when I drink, when I drink raw milk, it sits in my stomach. Great. I never have digestive issues with it. Um, it goes down like water. I drink tons of it right after a run. So your body's kind of primed in the same way, uh, to a degree, like granted, you're not necessarily going back out there and running again, but, um, when you're in a situation you were at, at Cocodona, you're probably thinking like, well, what's, you know, can't hurt at this point, might as well try. And, um, it seemed to work just fine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And I mean, like going to what you said, if, if this race was like Western States, for example, where I'm coming into the aid station for two minutes and then taking off and running as hard as I can, like, yeah, I doubt I'd be able to do that. Yeah. <laughs> I'm that's sure true. I'd, I'd puke it all up probably, but like a 200 mile race, you come to the aid station, you can eat a ton of food and then like take 10 minutes to power hike out of that aid station and allow that food to digest. So I do think the distance and the intensity matters. Um, but yeah, like Mm -hmm. I, I, I was joking with a bunch of people, like, because apparently I haven't watched the live feed yet. I've seen a few clips, but I guess like raw milk was kind of a heavy topic in the the live feed. (laughs) So I was joking with my crew and friends and family. I was like, it's too bad that raw milk comes from like these low, like, family grown farms. Like uh, there's no way I'm getting a sponsorship from uh, like a, a family owned <laughs> business. Kind of thing. Give you a, few, a couple free gallons of it. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, I mean, that stuff saved me. And then I do want to say too, like, like raw milk specifically for me, because um, I don't know how much you like have studied raw milk, Zach, but like, you know, I've had lactose intolerance, but mm-hmm. you know, the, the enzyme lactase is in raw milk, but it gets destroyed through the pasteurization process. So for me, like, that's why I have to do raw milk. If I was pounding that much pasteurized milk, I definitely would have had stomach issues in that race. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. You know, what's interesting about that too, is I think there's going to be, this is going to vary from one person to the next, I would imagine. Uh, I do wonder though, like if, you do enough raw dairy products that eventually you, you, you're not gonna be able to eliminate it, but if you'd be able to phase in some non-raw and not get the, not get the negative repercussions from it, because you sort of kind of created a gut biome that, that can, can sort of help along with that process. So like an example might be like you, uh, you keep doing your raw milk, but then you're able to also have just like some sort of dairy product that uh, doesn't have that raw nature to it in small quantities, like later that day or something like that. Um, and, and maybe it's not worth playing around with either. And <laughs> it's possible that that would work for someone with like a mild intolerance or like the average person who just hasn't had dairy for a while and bringing it back is a little bit of a, of a process to begin with. But um I think I was talking to, you know, Jeff Burns, right? Yeah, you, you yeah. definitely do. Yeah, I yeah. think he was telling me, because I had, I went through this, uh, I went through a phase in, I think it was like around 2015, 2016, where I cut all dairy out just to see like, because I just hadn't really ever gone very long in my life with like, like consciously avoiding dairy. So, you know, I was like, well, I wonder like, what would happen if I did that? Will I feel better, worse, or, or any different? And I did that for a while. And then Jeff said, Hey, you should try reintroducing, but reintroducing raw and then, and then yogurts and things like that. And that fermented dairy essentially. Yeah. And, and then like, see if 
bringing back non-raw at any capacity um, sits with you any differently now that you have some perspective of how you feel with and without it. And, and yeah, so I think like, who knows, but I mean, I don't, I wouldn't tell you to change anything at this point. It seems like things are <laughs> heading in the right direction for the most part. Uh, about, uh, I want, I have one other question for you before we let you go, Mike, that kind of goes along this nutrition topic. Cause I know as anyone who's listened to you on here before, listen to you in general, they know you follow a low carbohydrate diet. Um, at least relatively similar to what I do has, uh, how have you, how are you structuring it these days? I know for me, like my biggest change from any like block of time to a next within my diet, dietary habits is like less about macronutrient switches at this point. I feel like I've gotten a pretty good I, grasp of where I need to put the different ratios of carbs, fats, and proteins during different phases of training for me. And then it just becomes like the curiosity becomes, well, what can I build that out with? So it ends up being like, I'll do phases where I'm using like different types of foods to get there and seeing like where my preferences lie or how, like you were mentioning, like what actually sits and digests in my stomach better than, than anything else. Uh, what are you doing these days? Has, has there any, any meaningful changes since we chatted last or what's the outlook on that side of things for you? Yeah, I'd say there's a, a pretty big change for me. Um, I'm still low carb. Uh, before, like I was very much like I implemented a keto diet a lot more into my training than I do now. Mm -hmm. uh, and like I got the majority of my carbs back in the day from like a lot of vegetables with minimal fruits. <clears throat> and the fruits that I did eat was mostly like berries. So low glycemic fruits. But uh, recently, I would say since October of last year, I've started really diving into Paul Saladino's work. Mm -hmm. And for anyone that follows him, he's heavily like animal based with fruit, basically. So me, eggs, raw honey and fruit and raw dairy <clears throat> is kind of what Paul Saladino preaches. And he's kind of against vegetables. Uh, uh, he's not against it in the form where like, if you can, if your gut can tolerate it, then that's great. But like his big thing is that there's a lot of defense mechanisms that plants put out and they don't want us to eat it. And there's a lot of people that that messes up their GI health. And so when I started studying up his work, I started like kind of reflecting throughout my diet and just trying to remember how my body responds differently to certain foods. <clears throat> And I realized that like, you know, for example, Sunday dinners, uh, we usually go out to family on Sunday and have dinner with each other. And my family's kind of adapted to my diet and they've made like a bunch of meat and a bunch of green vegetables for me when I come out. And I've noticed that like, those are the days that my body feels a little bit more sluggish and I feel a little bit more inflamed on those days. And so when I studied that, I was like, well, maybe maybe I'm one of those guys where plants like vegetables actually do kind of mess with my gut and cause some kind of like inflammatory response. So I started trying his approach. I started feeling great. I started leaning out. I started having less GI issues. So right now I, I'm at the point where like, I'm not really tracking my carbohydrates. I know I'm getting roughly 150 to 200 grams a day, which, you know, it's still very low compared to like what most athletes are doing at this point for your lifestyle and, uh, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. So a lot of meat, a lot of eggs, a lot of raw dairy, a lot of fruit. I don't limit myself to just berries anymore. Like I'm doing mangoes, I'm doing pineapple, apples, really anything. And then I'm usually, you know, implementing a little bit of raw honey or maple syrup or something like that. So in general, I'm just higher averaged out than I usually am. And I don't see any negative effects in terms of like my ability to burn fat for fuel. Um, but yeah, so just a lot more fruit, a lot less vegetables, and then just a lot less, uh, keto strict mm -hmm. keto diets. Yeah. I mean, that's interesting. I think like a couple things that I think about when, what, when I hear what you're saying is like, one is I think like when it comes to vegetables as a whole, there's going to be like a range of digestibility from one vegetable to the next on average. And then there's right. also going to be an individual piece to that puzzle where like one person can probably tolerate X amount of this vegetable. while Another person has like a tiny amount in it. I mean, you may have a full on food allergy and they can't touch it at all. So like, there's like this huge range from one person to the next. Uh, and then like what I find interesting with, uh, folks who have either followed like a carnivore diet or something where you're avoiding a specific group of foods like vegetables or, um, or meat for that matter. Uh, 
what happens after they've given their to themselves enough time to kind of like completely remove it. And then rather than just having a little bit of variety within that group and then having the symptoms return versus bringing one back at a time. So I'd be curious with you if like, if you decided, all right, I'm going to try like one vegetable, maybe even like a, like a fermented version of it or something like that. So something like a sauerkraut or a kimchi or something like that. Mm-hmm. You notice nothing wrong with that, at least at a small quantity, then perhaps like you're good on that one. So you can kind of add it to your list of like, here's an option that at least in small quantities, I can get away with whether you want it or not is the next question. Cause at the end of the day, you got to get around to eating stuff and there's like way more stuff total than there is that you're actually going to eat. So if you have no <laughs> desire to have it anyway, then why even bring it back? But you know, some people are in this situation where they're like, I would really like to have, and this is what I usually ask people I'm working with. And if they have a food intolerance and they're kind of going down this path is like, well, is there anything you miss in that compart department? And if they say, yeah, you know, there's this, that, and that thing, it's like, well, um, let's uh, bring those back in a small quantity after you've given it some time and see if you, how you feel. And, you know, it, it varies from person to the one person to the next, to some degree, I think, but I, I always like kind of having that, that clean slate, so to speak, when you do kind of do something a little more very controlled, like you have to kind of give give yourself an opportunity because you think of yourself like earlier in life, like where do you even start in trying to find foods that do and do not work with you because uh, without completely eliminating huge groups, because it's, uh, you know, it's just, uh, there's too many confounding variables with, with everything still present in removing one thing versus the other. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, absolutely. Like, I mean, obviously when I'm traveling, there's not a lot of restaurants that offer like meat and fruit as a dish. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and so like when I'm traveling, especially like I've had to like adapt a little bit and see, So like, for example, like when I go to a steakhouse, like I either have to just like, just get a steak and turn down all the sides or try to get creative. Mm -hmm. And so like, you know, I'll, I'll go occasionally to a steakhouse and get a steak with some mushrooms and onions on it as my sides. And I seem to do okay with mushrooms and onions. Um, it's just certain other ones that I definitely try to avoid. So I, but like in my day to day, like cooking food, for example, like you know, I'm happy. Like, you know, I eat the same thing essentially every day at this point. <laughs> like, mm-hmm. you know, this morning I woke up, woke up and did like a, a Tabata type workout for 45 minutes to an hour. Uh, after that, I had a bunch of eggs with some beef liver, some raw milk, and then a bowl of fruit, uh, for lunch. When we're done here, I'm going to have probably some bone broth with a little bit more fruit. I tend to have a lighter lunch. And then for dinner, it's usually either steak or ground beef <clears throat> with uh, egg salad or, or yeah, egg salad or a little bit more fruit too. So, I mean, that's basically what I do every day. I don't miss vegetables. I personally don't feel like I'm missing anything from vegetables when you factor in the fruits and the liver that I'm eating and the eggs. And so, yeah, like, you know, you definitely don't want to get to the point where like, you're so strict that you can't adapt a little bit when you need to, but Mm -hmm. you know, when I'm home and I have access to all my food and stuff, like, you know, I don't miss vegetables. So I don't try to to implement it into each day personally. Yeah. Yeah. Like, like I said, it's like when you get around to like deciding what it is you're going to eat, even someone like yourself who has a very big, uh, calorie budget to get to over the course of a day, <laughs> uh, there's still only so many things you can go with. And I think like, I mean, following your digestion tolerances too, is like, I mean, that just, to me, it, it seems like it's a, it's sort of a quality of life thing. And, and I understand like, maybe I can eat this enough where now I tolerate it. But how much of that, in my opinion, is normalizing like a state that is not quite as good as it could be too. Um, so some, sometimes I think it's just like, yeah, there's, it's, there's a reason to stay away, at least on average from certain, certain foods for, for individuals. Uh, the other thing I was going to mention about your, your, what you were talking about too, is like with your carbohydrate stuff, I think that's like spot on. I think you it's, there's this, like, I think this desire to maybe get really to one side of the spectrum or the other when it comes to carbohydrate. And then it's kind of like the way I like to look at it is, well, you're sort of there's trade-offs for all of this stuff. So if you go completely to one side or the other, there's going to be a much larger trade-off on that other side. So I think like some form of balance, if we want to call it, that is probably going to be ideal. And then it's just about kind of finding like, where do you need to be metabolically for what you're trying to do? And for someone like yourself, it's like, 
you want to be good at burning fat. Obviously all ultra runners do like, no one's going to deny that even someone following a moderate to high carbohydrate isn't going to die that like being a good fat burner is going to be a desirable thing for, uh, for, for race day performance. But there's also like the question that needs to be asked for, for us on the low carb keto side of things is like, well, how fat adapted do you actually need to be? And for you, if you're hitting like 150 to 200 grams based on your lifestyle, like you're going to be very, very fat adapted. <laughs> however, <Yeah. laughs> we define, however, we define that word, you're going to be burning your, I guess if we want to put some definitions down, like your fat oxidation rates. So the amount of fat you're burning versus the amount of carbohydrates you're burning at the intensities you're racing at are going to be very, very, very high following the dietary practices that you do. So like if you ditch the 150 to 200 grams of carbohydrate, for a stricter approach, it's not necessarily going to do you any favors because, well, it, it, what it could do is it could take options off the table. Now, maybe like that fruit you're eating and it could be similar to the raw milk situation. Now you roll into an aid station and you eat some fruit and all of a sudden it's like, it hits the spot just right because it's not something that's unfamiliar to your, your daily like uh, food intake. Yeah. And I do think it's important to quickly note too. I heard somebody say this about you, Zach. I, I don't know if it's true. I don't know if it's like one of those phone tag things where <laughs> it progressively gets less and less true as it got, got to me. Yeah. <laughs> but like, I heard that essentially you tend to like do a little bit more of like process snacks two weeks or so before an event, which is something that I tried for this. Like, you know, me personally, like Siete tortilla chips or Siete potato mm -hmm. chips. I don't know if you've ever had those before. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So like, you know, the two weeks before this race, um, I hardly ever eat that, but the two weeks before this race, like I started having a little bit of that every day. I started doing like some keto type granola, basically the foods that I try to like go to in these races, I started like sprinkling in my day-to-day -day diet the two weeks before the race. Is that something that you do or did that translate wrong by the time it got? No, to no, that's, that's accurate. What I'll usually do is, uh, all, I'll put an, I'll, I'll, I'll have like some foods that are like more processed, kind of like the solid foods that I was talking about before that I'm going to try to weave into my race. Um, I'll start adding those to some longer runs. Like when I start building out like my long run a little more aggressively and when I'm fueling my long runs, they're always at a much lower quantity than what I'm going to likely race at. Right. Um, because I'm, I'm not racing at such a high intake value where I'm like worried about like getting a huge digest, digestive issue uh, by pushing up to what I'm going to hit on race day without getting up there a ton of times during practice. I might for like a few long runs at the very final stages of it, but generally speaking, my long runs are going to be like very, sometimes no fuel early on, but like when I'm still a decent bit away from the race, it's going to be like at a reduced quantity of what I'll do on race day, but it's going to match what I'll likely be trying to do on race day. So I'll start by introducing it in there. And then, yeah, once I get closer to the race itself, what I'll usually do, like, let's say it's something like a, like a salty cracker or a pretzel or something similar to that, which is just like really like logistically friendly, like race day fuel for the most part. Yeah. <laughs> like I might start like, like phasing that in for a brief period of time in place of whatever carbohydrate source I was going to have uh, typically around the year. So if that's like a potato or an apple or any type of fruit or something like that, I might just sub some of that out and, and sub that in. So my macronutrient targets that I'm typically hitting are still the same. It's just from a different source. Um, but yeah, it's basically just kind of stress testing how it's going to sit in my stomach and make sure I'm not walking into a problem more or less, <laughs> but, uh, so far it's worked, worked well. <laughs> yeah. It's a cool approach. Like I tried it and I, I feel like it worked well for me too. <laughs> I mean, obviously I had stomach issues the first day, but I mean, that was electrolyte based. You got that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but yeah. I, yeah. I, I do think it's important to like implement, like I heard the phrase, a little bit of poison <laughs> going yeah. into a race mm -hmm. just to make sure your gut's used to it. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. No, I agree. Awesome, Mike. Well, uh, I don't want to take you up too much because I'm sure you have a lot to catch up on after <laughs> being out at that race. It's always funny to consider that because it's like people think of a race and it's like, all right, there's obviously the training sacrifice on the day to day, but then the event is usually like, you know, it, it, it can make life a little more difficult around it. But when you have to break off like an entire week just for the event itself, I'm sure there's a fair bit of catch up when you get back. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I'm swamped, <laughs> but yeah, I appreciate it. Awesome. Like, well, where can listeners find you if they want to follow along, if they aren't already doing so? Just the low carb runner on Instagram. Awesome. 
Well, thanks a bunch for coming on, Mike. It's always good to chat and best of wishes with recovery and getting back to whatever epic thing you're going to be preparing for next. <laughs> thanks, buddy. I appreciate it. Same goes for you. Take care. Thanks for tuning into this episode of the Human Performance Outliers podcast with Zach Bitter. Hey folks, thanks for checking out this episode of the podcast. For those of you who are regular listeners, you'll likely know I'm also a professional endurance athlete and coach. If you're looking for a little extra help with your training and programming, I do offer individualized coaching options where you can work directly with me one-on-one. I'll personalize your plan and even scale it up to email collaboration and regular consultations. You can also access either of those on their own if you just want to contact me as you're navigating your fitness journey. I also have some ready-made plans. The ready-made plans follow my coaching philosophy and they scale from five kilometers all the way up to 100 miles and come in three different levels. So whether you're a beginner, intermediate, or advanced, I've got something for you there. And most recently, I also just added a strength athlete's guide to endurance program, which will help someone who is primarily a strength athlete who wants to either do an endurance event for the fun of it, bolster up their cardiovascular fitness, or just try something out, try something new. So those programs are built to be able to supplement a strength program so you won't have to give up on your gains in the gym while you're going after some running or endurance related fitness goals. You can find all those things on my website at zackbitter.com. Thanks for checking out this episode.